your source for everything paranormal, Para-X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. My story begins with seven weary travellers turning our gaze away from the white mount and the circling ravens stepping upon the road to Arbev. Little did we know that our every step was being closely observed as the mists of Anun prepared to close in around us. Once more. Marla Brooks. 
Hey, Mary Mead, everybody, and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron. I've been looking forward to tonight's show. Um, it's the time of year when Dave the Bard and I have our usual rendezvous announcing a new album. And um, tonight it's the third branch of the Mabinogi, and it was recently released. I'm excited for everybody to hear all about it and hear it. So, Dave, welcome back to Cauldron Central. It's lovely to be back again. We, it's getting a bit of a, a bit of a habit, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, we got to stop like this, but I'm not complaining, so <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, nice to speak to you again. Um, before we jump into the album, um, I want to thank you so much for all the in-house concerts that you've been doing on Facebook Live. I mean, they're much needed in these troubled times to get our heads mm. out of negativity for a while, and very much appreciated. And Thank you for inviting everybody to your virtual birthday party. <laughs> that, was that was crazy. A lot of fun. I don't know how many people have well over a thousand people coming to their parties, but <laughs> but did rather well. Yeah, yeah, that they've been an amazing surprise to me. Actually, I, uh, you know, when I like many people in the entertainment world um when the covid thing came along and i i suddenly literally overnight saw every concert of, uh, that i had booked disappear um you know i was i was worried you know i was i thought oh dear that's not that's not very good <laughs> and uh you know it's it's not just the fact that it's how i how i earn a living it's also you know it's part of part of who i am you know i i I love that interaction with an audience and just didn't know quite what what to do and then then i kind of saw people on facebook and i saw their updates and i realized that the community was very yeah it couldn't meet you know it had all these potential festivals coming up and everyone was used to hugging each other and standing Mm -hmm. in circles and sharing bread and mead and and I, I realized that all of that would go. And I, so I kind of thought, well, let's just see what happens. So I just announced one, um, you know, and, and I knew that the Facebook concerts could never replace a concert concert. You know, there's no point, in my opinion, in doing lights and all that stuff, you know, um, for, for just me. I mean, if you're a band, it's different. But if it's just me, you know, but mm-hmm. years ago. I, I, I used to do house concerts. I used to literally go to people's houses and, and play totally acoustic in their front room or in their garden. And they some of the people made a big event out of it. You know, they got their neighbours around and they put the barbecue on. And, and I thought, well, that's the way to do this, isn't it? Very informal, just like you've invited me around to your house, your garden, your front room. I'm going to sit there, no no amplification, no lights, just sit there and play you some songs like mm-hmm. I'm in your front room and make it very intimate. And that was what I thought would be the kind of nice compromise between a, a full live show and, and something that you can do on Facebook Live and, and also, mm-hmm. you know, make it free um, so that anybody anywhere in the world could could tune in. And I had no idea. I mean, I'd seen Doogie McLean do some house concerts, some concerts online, and you know he was averaging about seven hundred people. And I thought, well, you know, if, even if I got you know a couple of hundred, it'd be really nice for people to do it. And then that <laughs> first gig, you know, there was one thousand three hundred people all over the world tuned in, and I I could not believe it. <laughs> I could not believe it, and, you know, and, and then, it, you know, I thought, well, OK, it's a one off, you know, that, that was that was nice. Next time it will change. And and it hasn't. And, uh, and and people have been sending me such beautiful messages, you know, saying, mm-hmm. thank, you know, saying thank you, like you just done. Thank you for for allowing me to, you know, not allowing me, thank you for creating the space mm-hmm. so that people can feel, even though they're separate, they can feel you know, that they're part of something bigger, bringing people together all around the world who would normally meet up in, in their communities and covens and groves and things like that. It's been it's been quite amazing. And of yes. course, yeah, and of course, the chatter that goes on is in, is in crazy. <laughs> you know, it's like I look down and it's I get off at the end of the 45 minutes or an hour concert and there's like six and a half thousand comments. 
Yeah. And, and I can't help but think, well, if that was me behind live, I'd get really angry. <laughs> In a way. But somehow when it's texts and uh, it, it, it actually is just adds another dimension. And, and, and people are seeing their friends online and saying mm-hmm. hello and stuff. Yeah, it's been remarkable. Rem- yeah. Absolutely remarkable. And I, um, Well, call me out. To, oh, you're in chat. Oh, hi. And yeah. I'm, Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's lovely, and and I see them whiz past as I'm playing because I, I I never get a chance to actually interact too much yeah. when I'm doing the concert itself, um, and and to and to be honest, you know, when all this this is over, I'm going to carry on, you know, I I think that you know there's a lot of people around the world that enjoy my music that I would yes. never get a chance to go and play live for if it exactly. wasn't for this technology, you, you know, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's uh, you know, it's a it's a nice thing to do regardless, and it's just that the the COVID nineteen has opened the door to this kind of thing to happen, and and I think it's a it's a great addition to everything else that you do as a musician. I think you know. So, yeah, yeah, and yeah. it is very personal. You're talking to the camera when you're on stage. You're talking to a crowd. You're looking over the crowd. You're not eyeballing one particular person, but yeah. being being on camera like that it seems like you're talking to each individual yeah. so that yeah. makes a difference too yeah it does well I, of course i am i'm talking to everybody individually <laughs> yeah. well you know you're dave the bard you can do lots of things like that <laughs> you're very talented and creative so yeah well, i'm glad you're enjoying them i'm glad you're enjoying them I am and everybody else is as well. Now, I got a note from someone earlier who said they saw one of your in-house concerts a while back. And you mentioned in between songs, because there is chatter in between songs, that you were into ceremonial magic before you found Druidry. And they wanted to ask you what led you to the path of uh, ceremonial magic to begin with, at what age, and where did the switch from that to Druidry happen? Okay, okay. Uh, well, um, I mean, when I was a teenager, um, like any teenager, I was into uh, rock music. You know, my 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 my, my true initiator into ceremonial magic and that kind of path was probably Ozzy Osbourne and Black Sabbath, to be honest. <laughs> with you. you know, and, and and probably with a little bit of Ronnie James Dio and Rainbow and Led Zeppelin thrown in there as well. You know, there's that kind of you know, the man in black of Richie Blackmore, you know, I was was an idol of mine when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And I grew up, uh, I was born in Cornwall. So I had that kind of like connection with the rugged coast of the southwest of England and the mm-hmm. stone circles and Arthurian legends that are connected with there and the folklore and the fairy and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I, I grew up with a love of magic. And I also thoroughly enjoyed um, horror movies like you know the Dennis Wheatley Devil Rides Out and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So you know I don't know when years ago there was that thing uh, I think it was Tipper Gore and her crowd who've got that label put on CDs you know parental advisory and and yeah. they, they were saying you know oh if you're into heavy metal you'll get into magic. Well I'm living proof that they were right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> <laughs> you know I, I I absolutely adored it and and. Um, and I knew that I, I, from that early age, I felt that there was something else going on in the world that I couldn't see, but I could feel. And um, and this would have been, you know, this would have been 1979 and 1980 when I was 15 or 16 at school. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there were not the books out in those days on on Wicca and magic and witchcraft. They just weren't there. Um the route into magic was Uncle Alistair, was Alistair Crowley's working mm-hmm. a lot of the time, you know. And um, and although he is without doubt a, a very controversial figure, what, there is also no doubt that without him, what we do as magic would be very different. You know, him, mm-hmm. Dion Fortune, Robert Graves, yes. James Fraser, they kind of, their writings shaped modern paganism in years to come and right. um and so i i bought magic and theory and plastic practice by alistair crowley which is a bit heavy for a 16 year old but you know <laughs> you I, uh, I, time. Yeah, I read it and um and then a friend of mine came up to me uh i was i think i was 18 came up came around my house and he said dave i'm a neophyte and i went what 
said, yeah, I've been initiated as a neophyte. And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and he introduced me to this uh, ceremonial magic group called the Occult Church Society um, that were doing, uh, that were running a uh, chorus, uh, a postal course in, in, uh, in magic like the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Mm-hmm. And I just signed up straight away. And uh, I, I was initiated into the the society as a neophyte. I then went on through, uh, I think Zelator was the second degree. And then it was Practicus or Philosophus. And I reached number four. And then what happened was what happens to a lot of spiritual groups. There was a a cataclysm and the occult church society f- stopped it, it it just folded and left me kind of without any anywhere to go and at the same time and you know this is not to diss ceremonial magic because i know a lot of people get off on it and it's their spiritual connection mm-hmm. But I, tu- I turned away from Christianity because to me it felt like it came from the Middle East and it was it just didn't feel like it was something that was rooted in the land that I came from. Mm-hmm. And I had been in ceremonial magic. I had been working with the spirit of Osiris, Osiris and Isis in an end of terraced house in Brighton in Sussex. Mm. And that same kind of disconnection of there's got to be something from here. There's got to be something that I can put my mud, my hands in the earth and and just feel what's going on. You know, there has to be something else. Mm -hmm. And so as the ceremonial magic group closed, I wanted to turn my eyes away, if if, away from like the stellar um, over you know the, the kind of stellar airiness of ceremonial magic and i think i'd done enough of that and i wanted to turn my attention to the element of earth mm-hmm. i wanted something that was really rooted and grounded in the earth and when i say from the earth i live on i mean i mean you know the earth itself the planet yeah. you know because because there's you know to me um you know, a lot of the revealed religions are, all, are, you know, they're all trying to, they are death preparing religions. They prepare you for what comes after life. Mm-hmm. Whereas I wanted something that I could be engaged in fully in this life now, rather than think that this is a place that I want to escape from. Think yeah. of the earth as a sacred place. And it was that those thoughts that then turned me to look at modern paganism. And of course, at the time there were, you know, it, it wasn't like now. There weren't that many eclectic pagans around. You know, when you when you looked at the pagan paths, there were distinct paths. There was Wicca, there was witchcraft, there mm-hmm. was Druidry, and there was Esotru or the Northern tradition. You know, the Norse yeah. tradition. Right. And you know, and and so I explored a lot of Wicca and witchcraft. And in my heart, I'm a magician, so I do get that kind of path. Mm-hmm. But then I think the Cornishman woke up and the Celt, the you know, the Celt in me woke up and, and and when I found the path of Druidry, it was like putting on my favourite old pair of walking boots that I'd forgotten I had in a cupboard somewhere. They felt mm-hmm. so comfortable, so right, so worn mm-hmm. in, so familiar, like coming home that that yes. was what in the end made me uh, explore Druidry and that's where I stayed ever since. That was 1994 when I sent off for details of obod and uh and you know i'm still here now and uh, and i'm the pendragon of the order so something must have been go. right for me you know yeah so yeah yeah long story but that's it no but lovely actually, story uh, yeah but really it was definitely rock music that that made that that um that kind of in, ignited that magician's heart in me when i was a kid It's interesting how our paths, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt, but how our paths um, get, we start walking in one direction and we just kind of meander into the right thing eventually. You know, I don't think anybody gets it right at front, but you have to um, learn and grow and and listen to what feels right, as you said, and what doesn't. So Yeah, yeah. And I wouldn't say at all that I regret any time that I had in in the ceremonial world in fact I think it gave me a really good foundation because when you look at the western mystery traditions of the golden dawn and 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 those ceremonial magic orders 
and then you compare the ritual <clears throat> mechanics of Wicca and Obod Druidry with the four elements, the casting of the circle, the blessing of fire and water, you know, they share the same, they share the same roots, you know, they share those same roots. So when I found Obod, it was very, very familiar. When I walked into a, a Wiccan circle and I, I heard what was being done and said there of the invocation of the goddess and everything. Again, it felt very familiar. So, you know, I, I have no regrets whatsoever of my time in ceremonial magic. Yeah. You know, I think of it very, very, very fondly and, and as a door that I loved opening and exploring. Mm -hmm. So I know it was your intention. I'm going to jump to the album now. Okay. Um, <laughs> After reading or after releasing the second branch, you were going to take a break from the tales. You were going to write an album of music, but that didn't happen. And it was those crows that intervened once again, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it, it was. Uh, yes, it was. Um, you know, I, I yeah, I, I, I got to the end of the second branch. And I, I think I don't know if I spent, said this last time I was on the show, but. A very good friend of mine in the States, Arthur Hines, a bardic chap uh, and buddy, you know, I said to him, I'm going to have a break now. And he just said to me, what, what if the lady don't want that? <laughs> <laughs> what if the lady doesn't want that? And I said, well, if the lady doesn't want it, the lady get what she wants. You right. know, and, and I was I was fully prepared to to have a break. That was my intention. Do two, a break and then the next two. Mm -hmm. Um but that was n that was not how it was meant to be. I I, I stopped. I, I released the second branch. I had about a month, and then I started picking up the guitar. And I couldn't. There was nothing there. There was no inspiration there whatsoever. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know. And and if you you know as as will become apparent if we start talking about the album, the, the third branch mm -hmm. continues directly from the end of the second branch. There's not even a breath between mm -hmm. the two branches, okay. and it felt like. It needed that completion. I, I, it was the wrong place to leave it, you know, so that's why it happened. Yeah. Well, you mentioned, too, in one of your blogs that of all the branches, this one um, you originally felt the least connection with, but yeah. all that yeah. changed, didn't it? It really did. Um, yes, I, I loved the first branch, the second branch, and the fourth branch. The fourth branch is my favorite of all of them, or or was. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, and yeah, so I, so I kind of approached this one with a little bit of concern because when I when I first read it through and you know you just you just read it or you hear it you know you, you, there's there's it's it felt quite linear you know it felt kind of linear and uh, and there were there were those storytelling mechanics of having to do three things three times before the third one works mm -hmm. and i've always kind of like got a little tired if i'm sitting around a fire going oh no i've got to wait for another one. Oh, this one won't work i know it won't work you know so we've got so however it was once more it was the exploration of the law and the language of the story and the history of the story that opened mm -hmm. those doors and made me go ah that's what it's about and the, mm -hmm. you know, and and the moment I realised what it was about, and it was consequences of previous actions in the in previous stories. That's what linked everything together, and suddenly, mm -hmm. um, you know, it all made sense. And probably now this branch is my my favourite, probably until I get to the fourth. <laughs> <laughs> I think the fourth will always be my favourite, but I think you know this one. You know, it, it, it really came to life in the making, this one for me. It's kind of nudging itself in there. Yeah, um, definitely. So when you do research before you begin a new album, I mean, you, you're familiar with the tales and everything, but do you at times when you're, what you were reading does not necessarily coincide with your interpretation of the tales as you read them? And if so, how do you resolve that? I think before I really got my teeth into it and kind of lived it for a year and a half, to me, the third branch felt like second branch 2.0. Mm -hmm. It felt like, you know, it just finished off the first one. Yeah. Um, and I think I expressed that in one of my blogs and I, somebody said, oh, you crazy person, in, in far less words than that. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, of course, it's not that it's this. And, and I looked at it, I thought, no, you're right. It is that. Um, and so, so, you know, the, 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 the kind of, 
the relationship with the tale, I think, is what opens those additional um, doors and adds that additional colour to it. And and I don't think I've developed the relationship with this particular branch before I went down this road. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. All right. So first comes the words, then comes the music. Um, so here comes a multi-layered question. It's, mm. Yeah, well, I'm good at that. Um, <laughs> so you know the stories well, but do you reread them as a kind of kickstart and then do background research and maybe listen to the thoughts flowing through your head without much prompting or all of the above? Um, I, the, I always read the first thing i'll do is read through the translation Mm -hmm. and the best translation for me is is the one by sean ad davis um Mm -hmm. in the oxford press one it is fantastic Mm -hmm. um and i think most scholars will say it's the it's the best translation of the mabinogi so Mm -hmm. i will read that through and i'll probably read it five times you know over and over Mm -hmm. and then I basically get onto eBay and I get onto Amazon and I buy every book that mentions the third branch that I could possibly ah. find. Wow. And I read them, I read them all. Um, mm-hmm. And, and there's, there's, you know, a lot of scholarly work on the Mabinogi and the history of, and, and this, this scholarly research, you know, it, 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 it stems from anywhere from the 50s with ideas that may well have been let go of by a lot of people by mm-hmm. now or a lot of a lot of academics, at least by now. Mm-hmm. But nonetheless, when you hit when you read those, you say, you know, they are th- those those early scholars were inspired by things that are different to the modern scholars. And because the modern scholars have the different way of looking at things. Yeah. And so even those early scholars, if they have been proven wrong, there's something in there that's a spark that gave them that idea in the first place so i never entirely throw it away until i until it you know if it if it doesn't talk to me at all then i won't i won't put it in but sometimes you just think no that feels right i don't know if it's academically correct but it feels right you know it feels like that's a, there's an element of truth in there um and i just read all of the academic work um that i can find on that particular branch all the time making notes of the different bits and pieces that I can add into the story that are not in the translation um, that, that enhance the, the, the tale with that modern research. And then the next thing I do is I read through and I highlight to myself where I think the songs will go. Mm-hmm. That's the next stage. So, so with the, with the first branch, um, the songs are uh, they 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 progress the story more mm-hmm. to me than simply saying the words but i think again this branch more than any i the songs tell the story mm-hmm. um they you know so so you really have to listen to the lyrics of the song because if you don't listen to them it comes the story comes back in and you don't know what's happened because all of the action yes. has happened in the song and yeah. and and what I loved about this one is though the areas of the songs came in in places of real mysticism, you mm. know, and otherworldliness like the cauldron and the four cornered mm-hmm. car, the spinning castle and stuff like that. And yeah. I, and so they, I, you know, I really, really got my teeth into the songwriting on this album as well. Loved every minute of it. You know, it was, it was marvelous. And speaking of songs, I mean, we're going to take a break, but during the break, we're going to be playing one of those songs from the album called The Hangman. And can you give us a little bit of a lead in into the song, please? Sure. This 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 (laughs) this was a difficult song to write, to be honest with you, because (laughs) without the lead in of, of the story, it can feel a little bit. You know, a little bit dodgy in play, you know, to be honest, because mm-hmm. what it's saying, it's all about this person who is going to hang a mouse. Um, but the reason he's going to hang the mouse is because of the torture that has been emplaced upon him by by the loss of crops in fields and and, and, and stuff like that. Mm. So what I wanted to do, I, it, it, you know, the, there's the, the otherworldly songs are very very otherworldly but this one needed something else it needed almost like it's 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 almost it's what it's a ridiculous situation isn't it mm. 
you know, I'm going to go take a glove and inside it is a thief that is in the shape of a mouse. I'm going to make a load of I'm going to make a gallows <laughs> out of twigs <laughs> and then I'm going to tie this mouse at the end of a string and I'm going to hang it because it's a thief. It's utterly, <laughs> utterly ridiculous. Yeah. So the song is almost a play on that because the, the, it, it, it's such a happy melody. <laughs> It and is. Catchy, I loved it. Yeah, and it's a catchy chorus. So I wanted that kind of, um, you know, that feeling of opposites of, of of the of the tension of what's going on, but the ridiculousness of it as well in the in the in the catchy chorus, the melody, and the happiness of the the, the song itself. You know. Mm-hmm. So yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, everybody, um, <laughs> sit back. Don't look for mice around the floor, if you know. <laughs> and uh, we'll be back right after this song. Don't go away. There's more Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks right after these important messages. Then got out a small piece of twine, fashioned a noose, and tied it to the cross piece of the tiny gibbet. Empty lands and barren fields for seven years is all I have known. I have known. Who is this approaching me on our bed Still I see I'm not alone Not alone The poet shakes his head and his decree This act it is beneath you, can't you see? Offers me a pound to set it free To set it free It's a thief, and it will be a thief no more. I will hang it in accordance with the law. With its little legs are dangling, it will sway. I swear that it won't see another day. Now be on your way. Tiny twig, a length of twine, and this evil thief will soon atone, soon atone. Who is this approaching me on a harbour till I see I'm not alone, not alone? The priest shakes his head and his decree. This act it is beneath you, can't you? It's 
says to me, just name your price, name your price. The freeing of Rhiannon and Praderi, Manawedan said, looking directly into the druid's eyes. Welcome back to Stirring the Cauldron. Once again, here's your host, Marla Brooks. And yes, we are back. Dave the Bard is here, and um, I don't think he's hanging any mice at the moment, so um, we're free to talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, it, as you said, it, it's so ridiculous that it's funny, and, and, and you know, here comes the druid to save the guy. Please save the mouse. You know? yes. I, mean, I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, you mentioned... Um, and in, I think it might have been your blog, one of the blogs, that um, there were times during this project when it felt like your hands were being directed by forces completely out of your control. Um, who, do you, who do you think those forces might have been? I don't know. You know, it just feels like throughout this entire process, the first, second and third branch, all of them, um, there have been many times when I have looked at the page after I've written the song and just, you know, there's hardly any corrections. They're just there on mm-hmm. the page finished. And it's like, where, where did they come from? You know, writing songs is sometimes very hard, but with these, al- with these albums, it's, it, like I say, it's almost like that, you know, the, the spirits of these stories you know, want their tale told, you know, and, um, and I, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to come across as some huge egomaniac and saying that they are speaking through me and all those kinds of things, but it does, it does feel like the time is right to, to utilize this kind of modern technology to get their stories to a wider audience. Because I think if you say to people, you know, read the Mabinogin, that even the best translations are, are dry. You know, even the best translations are, you know, they're, they're hard going. Um, where And the reason they're hard going is because these stories were never meant to be read from paper and parchment. They were never meant to be read. They were mm-hmm. always meant to be listened to and heard. Mm-hmm. And and I think that, you know, these these recordings are, you know, with music and story and song and orchestration are, are in a way returning them to the bardic tradition that they always lived in before they were put in put down on paper, you know, and, mm-hmm. and that's why I think they they it just feels like the time is right and they want their stories told, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's so much more exciting to hear things than to read them. I mean, you know, some people read and don't let their imaginations run while they're reading. Other people do. But to have something verbally and musically, that that's a big plus, um, go with it. I think they can absorb so much more of it. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And even the translations, you know, the the – the hidden parts of the of the translation are held within the Welsh language, which you know most English people don't read the Welsh language; <laughs> they mm-hmm. read the English language. Sure. And the moment you translate the Mabinogi from Welsh to English, no matter how good the translation is, you will always lose the nuances of the words that are being used and, and the meaning of the words in Welsh, you know, mm-hmm. and, and those are the things that I try and then put back in, in different ways. You know, like I say, in the third bra- in the first branch, the name Havgan means summer and Aran, who he fights against is a dark and cold and gray. So it's obviously, you know, a, a, a dark half of the year deity against the summer it's that it's that kind of battle between summer and winter but that's not in the translations because it doesn't explain what Afghan means mm. you know only a welsh person will know what Afghan, the word actually means mm-hmm. and so uh, you know when the two meet for battle 
and have Gan steps forward, you know, Proeth in the, in the guise of Aram looks at him and, and looks across at Havgan and he sees the light of summer coming from the eyes of his helm that he wears on his head as if he holds within him the very heart of summer itself. So it's those little little things that I'm putting back in because of the loss in translation that you, you just can't get. Yeah, it, it, and I'm I'm still in awe of the fact that you speak Welsh so well. Oh no, no, I don't speak no, Welsh. No, seriously. No, well, no, well, I do not speak Welsh. I you? have the best Welsh coach in the world in the shape of Christopher Hughes, <laughs> who is the head of the Anglesey Druid Order. He, without him and his guidance, you know, these albums would not be what they aren't. He's, he's the monk at the beginning who speaks those words. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, I, and all, all, of the, all of the crazy Welsh hard pronunciations, mm-hmm. all of the coaching has come from Christopher. So, you know, I'm not going to take any uh, credit for, for that. You know, I, I, I you know, I, I've done the, the, the adapting, but the, you know, the Welsh is not me. <laughs> no. <laughs> But you, you absolutely, even the names, to oh, me, yeah. that's, you know, that's amazing. I mean, it sounds like, all right, uh, this may be not be exactly close, but I, I interviewed once Michael Dorn from Star Trek, you know, um, Worf. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and during the interview, he said, would you like to learn to speak Klingon? Huh. And I said, sure, don't count on me doing it well. And so he started telling me about the clicking sounds and the ticking sound, you know, all these different things that you had to do with your mouth Mm -hmm. um, to get that out. Mm -hmm. And I I was in awe, too, because he said, now say this after me. And I went, you know, I mean, it just didn't it didn't sound anything like like uh, Klingon at all. They would have had me hung or something like the mouse. (laughs) Um, but so to even be able to capture the small things, like even the pronunciation of the mouth of the, of the words, mm. because your tongue has to do different things, your lips have to do different things than speaking just plain English. Yeah, and that, and again, that is totally down to the coaching. You know, I, I, for, for, I, when I when I got to a branch, I went through all of the words and names that I wanted to say in the in the map in the recording and right. i sent them through to christopher and he then on facebook messenger sent me recordings of him saying all of the words three times back at me mm-hmm. and i basically just repeated them over and over and again until i could get my t- my tongue around the welsh pronunciations but you know the thing is the you know these are welsh tales you know they are yeah. you have to honor the language in which they were originally spoken and, and written down in. And, and mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, there's the, 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 <laughs> the history between English and Welsh is, is complex <laughs> and not altogether yes. happy, you know. And the last thing I want is for anyone who is Welsh to, to, to ask the question and say, you know, and that I'm not doing their, the, the tales of, of, of those, of that language justice or mm-hmm. somehow changing them. You know, it's really important to me that, you know, which is why I always check with Christopher, you know, is, is, is that right? You know, blah, 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 and that sort of thing. And, um, yeah, it's important to me, you know, you know, the, yeah. a lot of the world speaks English, but that is not the original tongue of these tales. So, no. you, you know, you, it's very important to honor that, I think. Yeah, and you yeah. have the talent to be able to do that. Some people still could not. They could try their best, and it could not happen. We hear people speaking <laughs> foreign languages that their accent is so thick, you don't even understand that that's the language they're speaking. But but yeah. you're a good student. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> Maybe, you know, well, the Cornish language and the Welsh language is very, very similar. They're both oh. Brythonic languages. Yeah. And, and even though, although, again, I don't speak Cornish, maybe it's something to do with that, you know, it's that kind of... Uh, you know, Celtic bones, and that was made by drinking and eating the, you know, the food of Cornwall. Maybe they Maybe. helped. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was one of those pasties, you know. The oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> Sorry, I was watching yeah. a show on that last night. Made me hungry. <laughs> um, so the the every time we come on, you know, you talk about the storyline of the branch. So we've talked mm. about 
the storyline for one, and we're talk, we've talked about the second branch. Could you kind of swing us into, from the second line, into this third storyline a little bit? Yeah, yeah. The first branch is a, a love story and a very much a tale of the Fae and the other world of Anun. The second branch is all about the battle and the battle between Ireland and the island of the mighty of Britain. And the death of Bran. Spoilers, if you haven't heard it, but you know, I mean, it is, yeah. it is over a thousand years old. This story, so I, I think I can. I'm allowed that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and the seven survivors of that war then return to the island of the mighty, and they return to a very changed place. The kingdom has been usurped by Caswallon, and is now the High King, and. They they travel and they hear the news of what's gone on there, and with the you know and and the, the second branch was tough because it was so dark and and such a, a challenging tale, and I realised that this one was the, the third branch was heading you into the realm of magic. The third branch is all about magic and consequences of the two tales that went before it, mm-hmm. and. In the second branch, there was no space whatsoever for a Dave the Bard uplifting 6-8 pagan anthem song. <laughs> there, just, there just was no room for it. It, 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 would, it was wrong. And so I wanted the first song that people heard to be uplifting, like, I'm, I'm home. After all that stuff, I'm home. And, mm-hmm. and of course, one of, the, one of the survivors who came back across from Ireland was the Bard Taliesin. And Taliesin is one of is the primary chief bard of the island of the mighty. He is the the pro- product of of consuming three drops of the Arwen of the cauldron of Keridwen, and he is one of the survivors who walks with them. But in the translations, he's barely mentioned. He's just a name of one of the seven survivors. And I thought, well, it would be more than that. This is Taliesin we're talking about here. Yes. You know, this is a world famous bard. Um, he would have more to do with it. So the first song of the album that you hear is a song called The Stones and Bones of Albion, yes. which is all about the Welsh have a word called hiraith, which, it, which has no direct translation in English, but it means something along the lines of an overwhelming yearning for home for missing in a home. And these seven survivors had been away for so long that they were suffering Hirath. And then they came home and Taliesin's voice sang the songs of the land and the, and the birds and animals and trees join him with him in his song. And there's this huge homecoming. And, uh, and that's the first song that you hear on the album. And it's one that I'm particularly happy with. Uh, it feels like, you know, it feels like, oh, at last I could stretch my, my anthemic <laughs> tendencies again, you know. Um, but the, but the, but then that leads into the further story. And basically the third branch is a tale of consequences, like I say, of the, of the, of the first and second branch, particularly the first branch. Um, and a tale of magic and conjuration and a magic spell and the interaction between the world that we perceive all around us and the unseen world of Anun that exists in exactly the same place where we stand right now, just slightly over to one side, you know, and if you could literally... If you could move your spirit to just one side, then suddenly Anun would appear all around you. And you know, that's what Anun is like to that to those stories. And I don't really want to go into too much because the story right. is, you know, it, it, there is there is a twist at the end and stuff of, of, of what's happened. Mm-hmm. Um but uh, but it's a it's a tale of magic. It's a real tale of magic and mystery. So um that's really as much as I'd want to say, because I want people to hear it. <laughs> yes, and and they must. I mean, it, it's just, it, it's very mesmerizing. I mean, your voice, the way you tell the songs, I mean, all of these things. Um, mm. Just to sit there and listen is, is so comforting and, and interesting. And yeah, so no, no, you don't have to give too much away, but <laughs> um, it, it just, it, it's good. It's really, really good. That's all I'm going to say. Um yeah. 
Okay, so with three down and one to go, mm-hmm. is it going to be a bit bittersweet once you begin the fourth branch, knowing that it's at the end? Or are you going to just be so happy that you undertook this this very time-consuming uh-huh. heart I mean, to your heart, and did it all, and and lived to tell the tale, uh, or tales. It, well, I'm I'm definitely doing an album of songs next, regardless. I don't. I've just got. To, <laughs> I'm going to do it. I can't do branch four now straight away, so right. I'm going to do some songs and and do an album of music next. That's that's definitely going to happen, and then I will turn my attention to the fourth branch. The fourth branch is 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 sprawling and intense and intrigue and complicated and it's probably the best known branch of all four um most people know uh, uh, something about and they certainly know the names of the fourth branch they would have heard of blood aweth they would have heard of gwydion the enchanter um and and those this is their tale and i i actually think that the fourth branch is going to be a triple album I think it will. Wow. There's, yeah, there, I don't think there's any way I will be able to get everything in for the full journey of the fourth branch on two on two discs. I don't think I'll be able to do that. I might be wow. wrong, but yeah. uh, to do it justice, I think I'm going to have to really go for it <laughs> with this one. Um, well, how will I feel when that's done? Oh, I will feel absolutely elated. <laughs> you know, I, I, I w- what I want to do is is get those four covers side by side and just yeah. say and when I do it, when I've got the fourth one done, I'm going to mm-hmm. get a, a card cover sleeve made that any, everyone who's bought the, the, the previous three branches will be able to slip all of those discs into. Mm. And down the edge, it will say the four branches of the Mabinogi Dave the Bard. And it will hold all four branches. And to me, you know, wow. I mean, what? where do you go after that? If you're a bard, where the hell do you go after that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's, it is the magnum opus. It's like, you know, a life's work, isn't it? You know, mm-hmm. and um, I will be as proud as punch when that's all done. And I'm also going to re- um, release the text as a, as a, a book as well you know once the four branches are done the words i'll I'll release as a as a readable book but uh that's the plan so it can go together um yeah yeah but that's a few years off yet so don't don't worry (laughs) i'm not worried at all um i'm just looking forward to it (laughs) yeah yeah and and i've really enjoyed this process and and there are other tales that need telling you know the 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 mabinogi is one Right. Uh, series of tales but there are others you know there's uh there's the edders of of you know the icelandic edders there's there's the arthurian tales of, yeah. of mallory you know there's yeah. plenty of stuff to do in a similar fashion so i'm not done with the stories so either i i don't think even even after the mabinogi is done no i think that's who you are whether you knew it or not before you started this yeah uh, yeah yeah, that that's absolutely who you are because you couldn't have done this so well if not. I mean, you know, you do the first branch and go, uh oh, you know, <laughs> and you didn't. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so are yeah. you are you gleefully kind of rubbing your hands together to get started, and ideas are popping into your head all the time for the new album, for the songs? Yes. Uh, yes yes it's not like last time um i i have got you know i always start with melody and so i sit down with my guitar and the melodies are flying out and and i think the thing is as well is that you know i i felt very connected to the story at the end of the second branch and i couldn't let that go until that's that was finished Mm -hmm. and and now you know i feel so connected to my path yeah. And so connected to to the magic of of druidism and and, and paganism that I can, you know, there, there's space and air to to really go for it and write some new songs that the pagans are going to love, you know, again. So I'm looking forward to that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I don't know. I think everybody that enjoys your your work are getting addicted, and not in a bad way. I mean, you know, we're not crackpots, but we just can't wait for the next thing to come out. So definitely looking forward to it. Um, where can people find uh, 
a place to find out when um, new things are coming out and where they can purchase the third branch and the first and the second if they haven't already, which shame on you if you haven't. Um, (laughs) Yeah, so the hub of all things Dave is... Exactly. (laughs) So I always say the hub of all things Dave is my website and it's a nice sparkly brand new website as well. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, it's paganmusic.co.uk is the website. And from there you can find the link to the blog, the podcast, uh, um, me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all those places Mm -hmm. are on that website. Um, And I also have a... An e-newsletter and blog sign-up form if people want to hear yes. news yes. of what's going on, uh, right, all, from, all from the website there. So, yeah, that's it. The hub of all things Dave, paganmusic.co.uk. And um, right before we go, we've got to go in a second, but when is your next um, live in-house concert? Do you know? Well, I don't know the exact date yet. Oh, um, okay. But um, I, I will definitely be doing one in, in, in early July, you know, next month. You know, um, okay. it's been it's been long enough. I think, you know, two or three weeks. Yeah, is, is we're having enough. withdrawal now. So yeah, we need to well, get we need yeah. to do it again. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. right. It's, it's on the cards. Thank you. Well, <laughs> um, really, thank you for um, sharing the new album. I like I said I pre-ordered it and I got it soon after and I've really enjoyed it. I'm into like my third listening now, <laughs> and uh, so uh, we will hopefully talk to you soon about a yeah. new album or, or anything else you'd like to come in and talk about. Brilliant. And um, Brilliant. of course, we've got to thank everybody for listening in as well. Yeah, and and the album is on Spotify and Apple Music and places like that already. So if that's where you consume your music, go and grab it and have a listen. You know, it's all there, all there for you. There you and, go. And Marla, thank you for your support and for getting me back oh, on your show and, and taking the time to talk to me. It's always a pleasure. Uh, it was my pleasure, not yours. Well, it might have been yours too, but it was more <laughs> yeah, mine. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and, and on that happy note, until next yeah. time, everybody, be wise, stay safe. Blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. Good night. Manawedan asked us what had happened and where the enchantment had taken us. You have heard how time moves in the other world. In truth, I didn't know how long we had been held in that other place. The lock and collar had been the chains that bound me. My hands rested upon the great cauldron, and I could not speak a word. Outside the tower, I heard the ocean. It seemed to me that I had been held upon an island surrounded by a boundless sea. My mother, she had worked the fields, with countless other horses. Exhausted at the end of every day, only to be whipped and pulled for more work the next. Many of her kind had fallen in exhaustion, but she persevered. The harness she wore on her return was the harness that held her. And because of our imprisonment, this branch of the Mabinogi will forever be known as the Mabinogi of the Lock and Collar. We heard no more from Fluid, nor from his warriors or retinue. He kept his word, and the seven Cantrevs lived in peace for many years, ruled over by myself, Kigfa, Rhiannon, and Manawita. It seemed as if the peace would never end. But peace, it seems, by the nature of men, is doomed to fail. I have yet one more tale to tell. Here ends the third branch of the Mabinogi.
tuning in to this episode of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Please join us again next week at the same time for another great guest and more cauldron stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited.